Today, Mark and I are at Ronald Bogg Park in Shoreline, Washington. And behind us is Ronald Bogg, named after the first judge in Shoreline. And it's now March, so it's been six months since we started these videos. Now the end of winter, we started them in, in the fall. And we want to go back over uh, using Venn diagrams to test categorical syllogisms for validity and do it a little differently this time. So I'm going to give Mark some problems to work and he's going to work them cold using just pure genius. I'm a trained professional, I should be able to do it. Yes. So how about this one? And you just explain how you do it. Okay. We'll, we'll, uh, the categorical syllogism will be all rats are mammals. All mammals are animals. Animals, okay. And so we'll conclude that all. What do you think I'm going to conclude? Well, I don't know if it will be valid or invalid. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Okay, all rats are animals. Okay. Well, I immediately have my suspicions, but let's see if we can figure out how a Venn diagram would prove if my suspicions are good or bad. Okay. Like that pen. So you mean you're intuitively already thinking? Oh well, yeah, but we'll let us see what happens here. So this is the way I would approach this. And different instructors are going to handle it, handle it differently and ask you to do different things. I think what I would like to do first is to abbreviate the argument, um, keeping the quantifiers, all, all in all in this case. And then you might just replace each term with a capital letter. How about R for rats, R mammals, all mammals, R A for animals. And then the conclusion by convention we'll keep at the bottom, all rats are animals. Can I jump in here sure, with something? On. Let's just do a, a rehearsal on this. So animals would be the major term because mm -hmm. it's the predicate of the conclusion, right? Mm -hmm. Then rats would be the minor term because it's the subject of the conclusion. And then the middle term is mammals because it's the term that appears in both premises. The one up above, kind of in the middle if you will. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have done some videos so far where we had Venn diagrams with two circles at the top and one kind of hanging below. Many other folks will do it the other side, the other way, with a circle at the top and then two circles below. It's, the answer will come out the same as long as you're kind of consistent here. If you approach it this way, uh, I suggest you take the bottom left circle, have it be the bottom, um, bottom left letter. Bottom right circle, make it be the bottom right letter. You'll notice you'll have one letter left up above that's kind of in the middle. Let's just make that one the middle circle. So the minor term's up here. There's your major term. There's your, uh, your minor term. Middle, major, minor. Okay, the way we're going to handle the Venn diagrams, if we're, we're only going to diagram the two premises. We don't diagram the conclusion. If both the premises are universal, then they just begin with all or no, it really doesn't matter what you do first. If both these are particular, they begin with some. It doesn't matter what you do first. If one's universal and the other's particular, you really want to diagram the universal one first. We've already kind of gone over this, but I'm just kind of reminding you about that. In this case, since they're both universal premises, it doesn't matter which one I do. The picture's going to look the same either way. So in a completely arbitrary manner, I'm going to diagram the first premise first. All R or M. And in my mind's eye, what I'm doing is I'm focusing on the R and the M circle. This is what I'm kind of looking at, these two right here at this angle. It's an all statement, a universal statement, so it's going to get some shading somewhere in the R circle. So I know the shading is going to be either here or here. Now, if I, since I'm saying all the R's are M's, every single R, if it would exist, would be <coughs> in this part here. This is where the R's would be. But shading in Venn diagrams tells you where things are not. So since the R's, if they exist, would be here, I would shade this area. Okay, notice I'm shading this crescent-shaped area here. That's this area. So I go ahead and shade that. So that would be a picture of what the first premise is saying. Now look at the second premise, all M or A. 
And what I'm doing now in my mind is I'm imagining the M and the A circles. All M or A, again, will get shading somewhere in the M circle. This second premise is saying every single M would be here in the A circle. This is where they would be if they existed. Again, shading tells you where things are not. So if this is where they would be, I would shade where they're not, which means I shade this crescent-shaped area, which is right here. So I go ahead and shade that. And that would be a picture, if you will, of the second premise. We don't shade, we don't diagram the conclusion. Now there is a complexity with Venn diagrams, and that is when you have universal statements, all SRP, no SRP, there's two ways of interpreting them. There's no way of getting around it. Uh, depending on the context, depending on what we're talking about, sometimes we mean what philosophers call the traditional or Aristotelian interpretation or standpoint, and sometimes what we mean is the modern or the Boolean interpretation or standpoint. The traditional standpoint is going to be used when you're dealing with things that everybody agrees to exist. So if the subject of these premises, rats and mammals, are things that we all know to exist, I know they exist, you know they exist, we're both going to be giving the traditional interpretation, the traditional standpoint, and it's that standpoint where we're assuming these things exist. So we're saying there are rats in the world, there really are, and everybody agrees with it, and every single one of them is a mammal. There really are mammals in the world, there really are mammals, and every single one of them is an animal. So we're actually making a double claim. Well, since you know rats exist, for instance, they've got to be in this R circle. And there's one, two, three, four different quadrants in the R circle. Well, rats exist, we know that. They've got to be in the R circle. They can't be in any of these quadrants because we've ruled them out. This is the only place left for a rat to be. So I'm going to put an X there on that basis. We might call that an existential X. As I'm putting it there because I'm giving this picture a traditional interpretation. All mammals are animals. You and I know mammals exist. Okay, well, they've got to exist in the M circle. Well, by golly, there is one right there. So we've satisfied the traditional interpretation. We know that the, there's a picture here of mammal existence. So this would be a picture of the traditional interpretation of this argument. If we were to give it a Boolean or modern interpretation, we wouldn't assume these things exist, and that X wouldn't be there. And in the next video, we'll give an example of a Boolean interpretation of an argument of things that don't exist, perhaps an argument about unicorns or leprechauns or straight A giving logic teachers. Paul, you want to jump in here? Okay. Uh, first of all, thank you for an excellent explanation. Very good. And I just want to emphasize that in the uh, videos we made before, we, we drew them with the, the two circles on top and the little one on the bottom. And just to, to make the point, to emphasize the point that whether you draw them this way or you reverse it and draw them the other way, the result is the same in the end if you follow the rules. So it doesn't matter whether you draw them this way or as we were doing them in some of our earlier videos that way. If you follow the rules, you'll get the same result in the end either way. And so just wanted to emphasize that. Very nice job. Okay. Next time. That's it.